Chapter 14 of Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle picks up with one of the main characters, Nobusuke Taigomi, thinking to himself, there is no answer, no understanding, even in the oracle, yet I must go on living day to day anyhow. And what is this about? Well, he is experiencing a major crisis. There was an attack on the Nippon Times building where he and, uh, you know, uh, Rudolf Wegner, the Opfer uh, operative and the uh, general were meeting to discuss this horrific Nazi plot to attack the Japanese home islands with nuclear weapons and then mop up the resistance afterwards. And the SD attacked them and... Uh, uh, Tagomi found himself using a antique pistol that he had bought and practiced with to kill two of the SD commandos in order to save Wegner. And this threw him into a crisis in which he's trying to use the Oracle, the E Ching, the Book of Changes to reintegrate himself, but not having much success. And so everything seems, as he says, Hopeless, He says, I will go and find the small live unseen at any rate until some later time when, and it just sort of goes off of there. So he says goodbye to his wife and he doesn't go to the Nippon Times building and he thinks to himself, well, you know, what about a day of relaxation? And then he thinks, trees and zoo are not personal. I must clutch at human life. And he uh, goes to sell, eventually, his, his pistol. But before that, we get these reflections going on. Perhaps I can never go back to the Nippon Times building with its stink of death. My career over, but just as well. A replacement can be found by the Board of Trade Mission Activities. But Tagomi still walks, exists, recalling every detail. So nothing is accomplished. And he goes on and says, hopeless wherever one looks. And there's this possibility that the oracle has actually withdrawn from the world of man in sorrow, the sages embodied in the oracle leaving. And he says to himself, we have entered a moment when we are alone. We cannot get assistance as before. Well, Mr. Tagomi thought, perhaps that too is good or can be made good, one must still try to find the way. So what he's looking for is some sort of guidance to the path that he ought to take out of the different possibilities ahead of him. So he then goes to Robert Childen's shop to try to sell the revolver. Now, why is he going to do that? Because he thinks that, well, if I can get rid of this, then maybe I can begin my life again. He's saying, is all of my instinct perverted from the memory of what I did, all collecting damage, not merely the attitude towards this one item, mainstay of my life, area, alas, where I dwelt with such relish? And so he thinks, maybe I could manage my anxious proclivities by a ruse, trade the gun in on more historicity-sanctioned Item. This gun for me is too much subjective history, all of the wrong kind. But that ends with me. No one else can experience it from a gun within my psyche only. And he thinks, well, I'll free myself of the cloud of the past. Now, Mr. Childen, not because of all the things that have happened to Tagomi, but in part because of the questionable uh, provenance and historicity of these firearms won't take it back. But he doesn't go into any great detail. And then he suggests to Tagomi, I have something else that you would be interested in. And uh, he tells them, these are American made, but these are not the old, sir. These are the new. This is the new life of my country, sir. The beginning in the form of tiny imperishable seeds of beauty. 
And Togomi looks at them and he says to himself, yes, there's something new which animates these, he decided. The law of Tao is born out here when yin lies everywhere. Yin being the darker, the uh, receding, right? Uh, the first stirring of light is suddenly alive in the darkest depths. We are all familiar. We've seen it happen before as I see it happen now, here. And yet for me, they are just scraps. They cannot... I cannot become wrapped as Mr. Childen here, unfortunately for both of us. So uh, Childen says, sir, it does not occur all at once. And what is the, the, uh, the thing? The new view in your heart. And Tagomi says, you're converted. And he actually says, your certitude is in questionable taste. Your Anglo-Saxon fanaticism does not appeal to me. And, and he leaves. And then he thinks to himself, you know... Maybe I should give this a try. Something is being offered to me here. What if I had bought one of those odd, indistinct items, kept it, re-examined, contemplated? Would I have subsequently, through it, found my way back? I doubt it. Those are for him, not me. And then he has a turning point where he says to himself, yet, if he, if, even if one person finds his way, that means there is a way, even if I personally fail to reach it. And so he tells children, I'll buy one of these little blob-like, squiggle-like pieces of jewelry. And he leaves the shop. And then he goes to a park and he takes the uh, jewelry out for inspection in solitude here in this little grass and path park of old men. He held the swiggle of silver, reflection of the midday sun. He, uh, he gazed down on it, om, as the Brahmins say, shrunk spot in which all is captured. And then he says, what's going to happen here? And he, he says to himself, um, forgive me, he thought into the direction of the squiggle. There's pressure on us always to rise and act. And he begins to put it away. And then he thinks, you know, I should act like a child in, in innocence. And he does so. He tells the, the thing in sato voce, right, in, in a low voice. The sales warranty promised much. He thinks to himself, maybe I should wake it up. And he actually does a bunch of different things. Tried everything he realized, pleaded, contemplated, threatened, philosophized at length. So he's treating it as a human treats an artifact. And then he does uh, go to a kind of, uh, it's both childlike, but he also says, I must be scientific, systematically in classic Aristotelian laboratory manner. He holds the silver triangle to his ear. There's no sound. And he says, what other sense might apprehend mystery? So he smells it. And there's nothing but a faint metallic odor taste. He puts it in his mouth. No meaning, only bitter, hard, cold thing. He held it again in his palm back at last to seeing highest ranking of the senses. And he's looking over it over again. And now he starts to think, right? Uh, metal is from the earth, he thought as he scrutinized. From below, from that realm which is the lowest, the most dense. Yin world and its most melancholy aspect, the world of corpses, decay and collapse, of feces, all that has died, slipping and disintegrating back down layer by layer, the demonic world of the immutable, the time that was. So that's one side, one aspect of it. And yet, he goes on, in the sunlight, the silver triangle glittered. It reflected light. Fire, Mr. Tagomi thought, not dank or dark object at all, not heavy, wearing, but pulsing with life, the high realm, aspect of yang, empyrean, ethereal, as befits a work of art. And he thinks, that's what the artist has done here, brought the dead to life. The past has yielded to the future. What are you? He asked the silver squiggle, dark dead yin or brilliant living yang. Body of yin, soul of yang, metal and fire unified, the outer and inner microcosmos in my palm. And now he's paying more and more attention into it. He's sort of going through it. And he's, there's this reference to the Bardo total afterlife existence. He says, I don't have to wait for death. 
the decomposition of my animus, my, my mind, my soul, as it wanders in search of a new womb, all the terrifying and beneficent deities. We will bypass them and the smoky lights as well, and the couples and coitus, everything except this light. I am ready to face with terror. And he says, I feel the hot winds of karma driving me. I won't shrink from the clear white light. What is this? Well, this is a way out of the cycle of birth and death. But he's not dying. He's experiencing this in his, his life, right? So suddenly he's drawn back to the present. How? There's a tall, blue-suited policeman smiling and says, I was just watching you work that puzzle. Tagomi says, it's not a puzzle. And he says, oh, yeah, my kids have a whole bunch of those sorts of things. And Tagomi thinks, this stupid yank, this white barbarian Neanderthal, this subhuman supposing I worked a child's puerile toy, right? And then he thinks to himself, oh, that's, that's really racist. That's below me. I shouldn't be thinking those sorts of things. And what does he find? The city he inhabited has changed. There are no pedicabs. There's no way of getting around in the way that he's used to. And then he sees um, something else. He stopped, gaped at hideous, misshapen thing on skyline, like a nightmare of roller coaster suspended, blotting out the view, an enormous construction of metal and cement in the air. And he asked somebody, what is that? And the man grinned, the awful, isn't it? That's the Emb Embarcadero Freeway. A lot of people think that it stinks up the view. And Tagomi says, I never saw it before. And the man said, well, you're lucky. And Tagomi is thinking, this is a mad dream. I must wake up. Where are the pedicabs? He doesn't find any. Instead, only cars and buses, all unfamiliar in shape. And so he goes into a restaurant, a dingy lunch counter, only whites within, supping, right? And these are going to be undeferential whites. All the stools are taken by them. He exclaims, several whites looked up, but none departed their places. None yielded their stools to him. They merely remained supping. I insist, Mr. Tagomi said loudly to the first white. He shouted to the man's ear. The man put down his coffee mug and said, watch it, Tojo. Mr. Tagomi looked to the other whites, all watched with hostile expressions. And then Tagomi thinks, aha, uh -huh, this is Bartle uh, total existence, hot winds blowing me, who knows where. This is a vision, but of what? And he says, you know, the Book of the Dead helps to prepare us for this. Where am I? And he realizes the silver triangle disoriented me. I broke from my moorings and hence stand on nothing. The lesson to me is forever one seeks to contravene one's perception so you can wander utterly lost without signposts or guide. And he, he says to himself that he's out of his world, his space, his time. And we could also say that the world there includes the culture, the dominance hierarchy, all of the history that's in there. And he thinks to himself, I've got to get back to my own place. Uh, and he feels in his pockets for the silver triangle and he realizes, oh crap, I left that and the briefcase that's got my gun in it in the park. I better go and get them. So he, he does that and then he's trying to refocus concentration and thereby restore his ego center. And he uh, gets it and uh, begins focusing on it. And he, he focuses uh, and says, scrutinize it forcefully and count at 10 utter startling noise, Erwache, for instance, which is you know German for get, wake up. And so he actually ends up doing that and gets up and he's back in his own world. Diffusion su subsided in all probability. And he says, now one appreciates St. Paul's incisive word choice. Seen through glass darkly is not a metaphor, but astute reference to optical distortion. We really do see a stigma to astigmatically in fundamental sense. Our space and our time are creations of our own psyche. And when these momentarily falter, 
it's like an acute disturbance of the middle ear. We lose our balance. And so he says, I'm going to go and check to see if that awful freeway is there. And then he calls some two little Chinese boys and says, hey, I'll give you a dime. Go check to see if there's any pedicabs over there. They come back. And that's how he realizes he is now back in his own world. And a reintegration has occurred for him through this. He thinks to himself, back to office and job something that was precluded by the crisis that he was in. He rose to his feet, gripping the handle of his briefcase. Duty calls, customary day. Once again, he gets in a pedicab and he says, take me to the Nippon Times building. And that's where he's going to have the encounter with uh, the Reichs Council and, and uh, also experience some, some medical conditions as well. But that's outside of the scope of this particular important moment, which shows us that the world of the narrative isn't the only possible world, that there is one in which the Axis didn't win World War, world War II, perhaps multiple worlds in which that didn't occur, because we have the story of the grasshopper lies heavily as well. So this is the resolution of an important crisis where Tagomi shifts, whether he's actually going into another dimension or another parallel world, or whether this is, as he's saying, you know, a lack of concentration and then being drawn into something else which isn't quite as real, a kind of hallucination. So that's left unresolved here in this part of Dick's the man in the high castle.